and we've we've actually worked on client projects before where the the budget was over a million dollars so fifty thousand dollars is naturally not a lot compared to a million <laughs> try to find yourself using google without using your name or your company name de wereld verandert elke dag en in dit tijdperk zijn we meer digitaal dan ooit tevoren. Maar hoe zit het met de toekomst? Mijn naam is Nienke en samen met Kamari presenteer ik de What About Tomorrow podcast. In deze podcast ga ik praten met mensen op onze werkvloer en met inspirerende ondernemers over behaalde successen, hersenspinsels, veranderingen in het vakgebied en hun oog op de toekomst. Dit is de What About Tomorrow podcast. Hoi allemaal, welkom bij een nieuwe podcast What About Tomorrow van Kamari. Mijn naam is Nienke en ik moet zeggen, ik ben een heel klein beetje zenuwachtig. Ik heb namelijk iemand heel erg speciaal vandaag uh, waar ik mee ga praten. Namelijk Chris Doe. Hallo. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today for the What About Tomorrow podcast. I'm just very honored that you're here and I'm really excited. I have some questions for you. I want to get to know you better. Um, yeah. So to start off the podcast, for anyone yes. who does not know you, yes. describe yourself. Where do you come from? What are you doing right now? Like where, how did you get where you are right now for anyone who doesn't know you? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Doe. I'm a loud introvert. I'm a recovering graphic designer, a father of two children, a middle child and a serial entrepreneur. I began my professional career in graphic design. I launched a company called Blind and we made commercials and music videos for some of the largest agencies and brands in the world. And in 2014, a friend of mine invited me to make YouTube videos with him, which I reluctantly agreed to do. And the decision to do so changed the course of my life and my business. Now I'm a full-time content creator and educator. My company is called The Future, and this is all what I do. And we have this really, really big mission, which is to teach a billion people how to make a living doing what they love. That's amazing. Amazing how you just presented that. That's so nice. So you said, I just, I just got... Like you make you made music videos as well for artists. Yes, yeah. Like high quality content music videos. Yes, for um, a band called Coldplay, uh, for Justin What? Timberlake, for Noah Sparkley, no. for Jet, uh, for Cinematic Orchestra, and one of my favorite bands, The Ravenettes. That's I didn't even know that. That's great. Oh my god, how was yeah. that phase in your life when you did like the music videos? Music videos are great. I love working with artists. It's very um, uh, creatively fulfilling for your soul because yeah. artists don't worry about uh, test markets and surveys. They they want to make cool things and you get exactly. to do something that becomes part of the pop culture. So I really like it. So with the future, you kind of do the same. Like it's an online education uh, platform for anyone who wants to do what they love and do it for a living, right? So that's what you that's teach. That's right. That's right. So I feel like I've been very fortunate in my life to be able to, A, pursue creativity as my main source of income, to be a professional, to be able to attend one of the best design schools in this country, and wow. then to have a successful career afterwards. And I feel um, when you achieve some level of success, it's an obligation for you. As the expression goes, when you're at the top of the elevator, you need to send it back down so that others can achieve the same. And It is my life's work, my mission to help other creative individuals, not just traditionally trained graphic designers, but anyone who, just, who thinks of themselves as a creative person, a tattoo artist, maybe your hairstylist, a fashion designer, an architect, interior designer, whatever, even accountants are creative. If you think of yourself as a creative person, I want to help you be successful and build a sustainable business. So is that only in money wise or also like just doing what you love and Like, like you need to earn money to do what you love, you know, so. Yes. So I try to help people with the, the earning money part, right? So we assume that exactly. at some level you are a master practitioner of what it is that you do. You have mm -hmm. training, you've done the work, and now you need help with talking to clients, with marketing, with negotiations, and also with conquering your limiting beliefs. And we try to help people with that. That's amazing. That's very nice. So um, for you, for example, like how would you start a project with a new client? Do you have some kind of strategy on we go to this first and then we go to here? Like, is there a path that you follow when you have a new client or is it always or like is it different per person? Well, currently we don't have any more clients. We have an yeah. audience. We have a community. But exactly. you talked about before when I do, used exactly. to do client work. Yeah. yeah. 
yes, we do have a very specific way of talking to clients and it's, it's refined over 20 plus years of working with clients. And it starts off uh, when we're doing client direct work, we need to do strategy and discovery uh, exactly. because we need to understand what the business objectives are, how it's going to be measured and what challenges they face. And we need to understand more about their brand, their brand voice, and also who their customers are and what they're trying to accomplish in their life. And so we charge money to do that. Uh, historically speaking, we charge anywhere between thirty to one hundred thousand dollars to do the discovery phase, discovery and then once we do discovery, only. yes, just okay. to, just for discovery, we write up a document and said, "Here's what we discovered. Here are the insights," and then we also do budget planning with our clients. And this is a big shift from the way that used to work. So when we do the budget planning with a the client, they 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 will say to us, "We want to achieve these um, goals. Here's what we think will work." We do this together as a facilitated conversation. And then we say, well, based on this, let's prioritize what's most important and let's put a budget next to each one of these things. And that way I can help them like that feels too too much money. That feels too little money. And then they get a sense of not only the the impact it's going to make, how hard it's going to be, but also how much it's going to cost. So they're as informed as possible. From there, they decide we want to do two, seven and 14 and in that order. Oh, and they, okay. they will also then decide uh, we want you to do it or we want to just take it and do it ourselves. Either way, we're, we're, we don't care. So not only you would like you would do it for people, but you will also do it like in advice kind of way. You would advise people on how to do it and give them like handles to do it themselves, to teach them kind of. Yes, sort of. Okay. I mean, when we do the discovery strategy part, we have a roadmap. We develop mm -hmm. a user journey. We talk about uh, services, functions, and features for things that they need to build, different ideas for marketing. We help to write the tone of voice for messaging, things like that. Oh, okay. But then the actual deliverables, like they let's say they, they know the, what the roadmap looks like. Now they need to go make a 20-video ca campaign based on the strategy so exactly. we can either advise them as a separate thing or they can just take what they've learned and hire anybody that they want. Got Almost it. always they hire us to do everything. Uh -huh. That's nice. It's not it's not obligatory or yeah. obligatory. So I hear you say, um, I think I got it right. Between fifty to hundred thousand dollars, you would charge. Uh, yeah, between thirty to hundred thousand. Between thirty, 30. to hundred thousand um, dollars. Yes. Did it ever feel like an obligation for you to mention those kinds of prices to anyone, or is it like you have those type types of clients, so it it, it does not feel uh, not like an obligation, like um. How do I say it in English? Like a bump in the road. Like it's difficult to say, well, this is $50,000. Yeah. Like, have you, did you ever feel that kind of nerve to say such a big um, price out loud? That's a very good question. I would say that probably if it were in the first five years of my business, I would probably feel a little bit more anxious around that. Yeah. But I've been in business for 25 years. So you can't exactly. stay in business and work at the high level if you can't talk about money. So no, I have no issues with talking about money. And we've we've actually worked on client projects before where the the budget was over a million dollars, so fifty thousand dollars is naturally not a lot compared to a million, <laughs> right? That is so that is true. It's all contextual, but we talk about money as early as possible because I don't want to waste the client's time. So when clients initially reach out or were introduced, I'll get right to it. I'll say to them before we go too deep. What kind of budget are we talking about? Exactly. And they say, well, we don't know. And I say, okay, that's fine. I just want to let you know, just to get started, we have to do discovery if you want to work with us. Mm -hmm. And it's going to start at $30,000 and there's no deliverables. It's just discovery. It's just it's just a strategic conversation. So then I know right away, are they in it or they're not into it? We'll know. But I think it would be um, like at some point you have to choose your client because some clients, maybe a lot of the clients are not willing to pay that amount of money um, for a discovery phase. So maybe a lot of clients would decline your offer. Like how yep. how does that work? How does that make you feel? Did, did you ever doubt like the prices you, you have? No, I think the prices are a bargain and the prices are a form of a filter to keep certain people out. So the reason why I like to bring up the money really early is because I don't want them to invest two hours talking to us only to realize they can't afford it. They yeah. don't want it. They don't need it. Yeah. Right. And so so here's the thing, though. When people come to us, they see this body of work or someone recommended us or something like that. And then they know like we like this quality. And we also document our process pretty clearly that it starts with discovery. 
Here are the insights. Here's what we learned. Here's how we translated those insights into deliverables. And here are the results, if applicable, and th that we're able to get. So when someone reaches out, they're like, oh, we love the work that you did for X, Y, and Z. I said, like, great. Here's how we got that work. Exactly. We did this. And it's required. We, we don't take on clients if we don't know uh, if we can't do the discovery with you. Exactly. Ever really felt refused about it from a client who who told you, well, I think that's too much money. Like, I, I mean, some clients, they can get really personal. Like you like someone and you start talking and then you once the money comes to the table, they decline. And they're all of a sudden like you've never really felt that insecurity. Like maybe like how do you deal with that? And how do you feel like you're strong enough to this is my budget and either you accept it or not. And then we continue or not. Like, how yeah. do you feel so secure about it? OK, so what we need to do is we need to separate how we feel about ourselves and how we talk about money. They're two very different things, right? Yeah, So it's not personal. You have self-confidence, which is a belief in your skills to be able to do things. And then you have self-esteem, your belief in your own intrinsic value to the world. And those should not be influenced by external forces, right? So if I do a piece of work and I know it's good and you look at it and you're like, that's terrible. I'm like, okay, that's your opinion. I don't feel bad about myself. I still think the work is good. Yeah. Conversely, and yeah. this this will ring true to your audience is if I do work yeah. that's bad, I know it's bad because I didn't have time and it was just I phoned it in, you know, <laughs> and then you say, yeah. Chris, that's amazing. I'm also not going to believe you. you. You follow? And you, we, we know this. We understand nice. this. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you might get praised for something that, you know, is not good and you feel terrible about it because you know what you know. So it, it has to work both ways. So if I know that the work is good and I know that what value I can bring to the table is high, what the clients say about price and whether they want to work with you or not doesn't affect me emotionally. It doesn't affect my wow, own yeah. esteem and my self-confidence. Now, when we talk about money, and this happens all the time, because if you charge a lot of money, you're going to hear no a lot. It's by design. Yes. That's a positive result, right? If you think of every luxury brand in the world, whether it's cars or handbags or watches, the price sets a bar for who can afford these things. And the people who buy these things want to be able to say to themselves and to their colleagues, I was able to hire the best. I was able to afford the best. I deserve the best. Yeah. And so it's creating a barrier. You cannot walk into a, um, a Louis Vuitton store and say, well, I don't like your prices. They're, they're like, fine. <laughs> we, we don't need to sell yeah, to you. Yeah, that's fine. It's by exactly. design that that's you don't like the client. prices, right? It's not your client. Absolutely. So when a new Absolutely. client calls me, there are things that I know about business that I can tell right away if they're going to be able to afford us or not. And once yeah. I hear something that they say, I'm like, oh, I see. For example, if they call me and they say, we're the founders of a company where my partners and I want to talk to you. I already know that they're a small company because founders usually cannot call us. They have layers of middle management. They have appointment mm -hmm. setters. They have a lot of people in between. So as soon as they say that it's the founders and they're calling me, I'm concerned that our budgets might not meet eye to eye. Now that's not to say it's exactly. never the case, but it's it's a it's a little little warning signal. So I say to them right then and there, super happy to talk to you. I just want to let you know something, okay? Because I would love to continue this conversation, but to start to do discovery with us, like what I just said, it's going to be a minimum thirty thousand dollars. Now, that may not be something you want to spend, and I'll, I'm happy to talk to you, but I need you to know that right up front. It's like, oh, my God, Chris, exactly. that's so much money. That's more than what we thought about the entire thing. But I'd like yeah. to talk to you still. I'm like, cool, we'll continue talking. And so what happens by the end of the conversation is that they say usually to us, I wonder how I can find the money because I really like the way you talk about your work and what you're going to do for us. And sometimes mm -hmm. they find it. Yes. Oftentimes they cannot find it because it's too big of a gap. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, like you said, it's okay. Not everyone is your client and it doesn't have to be. So have right. you ever refused a client because of a, uh, maybe it didn't match. Like for me, when I do work with a client, I always feel like I have to be not too personal, but I need to have a connection with someone to work with someone. I'm a very emotional person and I like to, you know, um, celebrate together. And when we lose something, lose together, you know, it's always a dream team. Um, so did you ever decline um, maybe um, or quit? like a partnership or, or an, maybe a client because you didn't feel right? Yes. In, in my career, I think I've fired a handful of clients. And the way I fire them is I just say, I don't think we're a good fit. I'm going to refund mm -hmm. your money. And I wish you the very oh, best. Wow. Yeah, we've had to do that a couple of times. The money. 
I refund the money because I don't want any kind of negative feelings, right? And I'm yeah. saying in this relationship, uh, I'm not a good fit. And I'll tell you, uh, both or a couple of times in which we fired the client, it's because they're very indecisive. Okay, yeah. So one day they want this and one day they Correct. want that and they Correct. cannot make a decision. They cannot make a decision. Typically the way they, they speak and, and you'll, you'll know this and you'll feel like, ooh, it's that person. <laughs> They'll say something yeah. like, well, I showed it to my son. I showed it to my daughter. I showed it to my husband. Or I showed it to my wife. <laughs> when they say that, yeah. I'm counting down how many minutes it takes me to say, you know what? I don't think we're a good fit. Um, I don't want to yeah. work with you anymore. I say it very Absolutely. politely, very professionally. I'm not upset. I just think you need somebody else. And I thought yeah. I was talking to the decision maker. As it turns out, I'm not talking to the decision maker at all. Oh, <gasps> yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, speaking of um, like projects, what has been like, I know you've done a ton of things and you still do so much things for like, as we speak of right now, what has been your most fun project you've worked on? Could be a project you're working on right now. Could be a project for a client. Could be a music video, like your most fun project where you um, not only in success, but like with the people, with the team, um, the things you've created, what has been your most fun project? I know it's a probably very difficult question, but I was curious to see it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I'll answer this two different ways. Okay. Uh, I'll answer mm -hmm. this first. So what is the the most fun I've ever had working on a client-related project, and that was uh, making a music video for the band The Ravenettes, which I think they're Danish, um, mm -hmm. and they're amazing to work with. They're, they have a very unique sound, and they just let us do whatever we want. And so when we wrote the treatment for them, they're like, approved. And when we show them tests and animations and storyboards, they say, approved. Uh, amazing. Okay. Right? So it's the best kind of client ever. And in yeah. fact, when a client trusts you so much, it's actually more stressful to do the project because yeah. typically if the project doesn't go well, what do designers say? They say, well, the clients changed some things. Uh, they didn't, they were poorly organized. Uh, they, they wanted to make something bigger when they shouldn't have or, or use a crazy color or a horrible logo. But when a client says, yes, 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 you basically have no excuse as to why the work isn't the best thing that you can make. So there's exactly. a lot of internal pressure. And so we give the very best of ourselves and we enjoy the process the entire way because we feel like nothing that we do will be wasted because no one's going to tell us to do something differently. And exactly. So, so you can be free. We, we can be free. And when we do this work, in fact, the, the music video I directed for the Ravenettes is the one that won us the Emmy uh, for the for art direction uh, and design for music video. So that's the reward. It's great. It's fulfilling. And I feel great that we're doing something good for a band and a song that I like and, and really uh, enjoy working on. Mm -hmm. Now, the best project in my life is this project called The Future, which is mm -hmm. a whole company. It's not a project. Yeah. It's a mission. It's a movement. And it's what I do today. I don't do any more client work. I haven't done any client work since December of 2018. And so mm -hmm. I've been running an 18-person company now for the last uh, for years, client free, loving every moment of my life. And I, I get to do this as a living. I get to help people. Exactly. And the more people I help, the crazy thing is the more money we can make. Yeah. So right. Like as of right now, like what is the, the way to monetize your community? What kind of monetization do you use? Is it the podcast? Is it the videos on YouTube? Is it the coaching calls? Like what kind of uh, monetization? ways do you have right yes. now? Yes. The number one thing that we sell is uh, access to a membership. It's a peer-to-peer -peer coaching group. And mm -hmm. there are over 700 members in it, uh, soon to be 1,000. And that's the biggest source of revenue from us. The second biggest source of revenue from us comes from a variety of courses, modules, templates that we publish and people buy. And oh, that's yeah, how we're yeah. able to sustain ourselves. The third way is through ad revenue from YouTube and also from speaking engagements and sponsorships. Uh, and I think speaking and sponsorships is number three. And number four would be uh, like AdSense revenue. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So you built like a whole monetization around your own community, which is great. And I've seen a lot of people doing it recently. It's such a big thing. Um, that's that's great. I'm, I'm just really excited. Um, so 
as of right now, what has been the biggest lesson you've learned while working for yourself? Um, and what kind of tip would you give others who are still in like in the middle of trying to pursue what they they're doing, what they love, but they're also still trying to keep on that to that nine to five? Like what has been your biggest lesson and what do you want to like give out to the world? What is your biggest um, mission for them right now? Mm. Well, for, for people who want to quit their nine to five, they have different challenges. But I would yeah. say like once you're in business, uh, you need to learn how to speak like a business person. Uh, Todd McFarlane, who is probably arguably one of the most successful comic book artists of all time, created a comic book character called Spawn, used to draw on Spider-Man. He was interviewed and they asked him, like, what's the secret to your success? He goes, you know what? I'm a decent artist. I'm not the best artist. However, when you're dealing with business people, most artists speak the language of art. He's like, I speak the language of business and art, so I become bilingual. And this is really, really important. So the takeaway here is Todd is an excellent artist. He's kind of downplaying his ability to draw. But there are better artists out there that are less successful than him because they never learn to speak the language of business. So you as a creative person, you've gone to school or you're self-taught and you have skills. But you think that the skills are the things that are going to sell you. It's not. At a certain point, there's a law of diminishing return. Meaning if you spend another five or 10 years getting better at design topography or web development, it will not exponentially increase your your, your fees and your value to market, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but if you were to learn soft skills uh, like negotiation, pricing, communication, overcome your limiting beliefs, I believe you will two, four, five X your revenue potential because you're learning to speak the language of business. Would have um, would have this helped you in the beginning when you were starting to be an entrepreneur? Like, is this something that you've learned along the way because of of past mistakes? Yeah, I mean, everything I'm telling you is built up on 25 years of making mistakes. So in the okay. beginning, mm -hmm. when I graduated school, um, I graduated at the top of my class. I thought it was a hot shot. I thought <laughs> that people would just automatically magically find me, and they didn't. <laughs> and I had to actually go out and figure out things like marketing. Back then, the internet was just in its infancy, Web 1.0. But today, you have the power of di directly connecting to your potential audience, your customers, and your community through free and open social platforms. So you have an incredible amount of marketing power at your fingertips, but most of us don't take advantage of it. What we do is exactly. we post pieces of our portfolio. We never talk about it. We never try to build authority or domain expertise. We don't narrow ourselves down so that it makes it easy for people to know who we are. So all those things that we do kind of fight our ability to get work. Here's a simple test that people can do. Try to find yourself using Google without using your name or your company name. See how hard it would be to find you. I love that advice. That's very nice. I've never thought of, of doing that before. That's very yeah, nice. So, so great. In Austin Kleon's book, Show Your Work, he says, to be found, you have to be findable, and you're not findable. Like, nobody can find you right now. So Except if for your I name. don't know yeah. your name, and if I don't know your company's name, how the heck am I going to find you? Because if I knew your name, I don't need to find you because I already know you. Exactly. And there's a ton of ways to get out there. Many ways That's right. to, to get out there. That's amazing. Oh, Chris, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for talking to me today. It was such an inspiration to talk to you. I, I love following you on your social media. Uh, for anyone who has, is not known Chris Doe, please check him out. I'll put the links in the description of this video. Um, thank you so much again for joining my podcast. It has been an honor. My pleasure. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Thank you um, for those listening. Thank you wel iedereen voor die thuis kijkt. Dit was de podcast met Chris Doe. Ik uh, vond het zo geweldig. <laughs> en ik zie jullie in de volgende podcast weer.